Immediately Jesus said to his disciples, get into a boat and go ahead of him to Bethesda. While he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of a lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples training the oars because wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but they saw them walking on the lake and they thought it was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they crossed over, they landed at Garrison and, the, and, and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus. They ran through a whole region and carried to, who were ill on the mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages, towns or countrysides, they placed who were ill in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak and all who were touched it were healed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you. Uh, we're going to just uh, pray, uh, and then we're going to dig in uh, to God's Word. Let's uh, pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would uh, give us faith to receive your Word this morning, understanding to know what it means, and the will to put it into practice. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. <coughs> Well, I wonder, uh, as we look at this uh, picture this morning, I wonder what you see when you look at this picture. Hidden in this picture are two people, at least two that I've seen. Can you see a younger woman? That's her chin and eyes looking away. And there's an older woman. That's her eye and chin looking sideways. I needed several minutes to see the older woman. Perception is everything, isn't it? Sometimes we can look, but we can't really see. Sometimes we see, but we don't understand. And I can see some of you are still scratching your head <laughs> trying to find the two women. Well, that's exactly where we find ourselves here in the Gospel of Mark with Jesus' disciples. They've seen Jesus' incredible miracles. They've seen him healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. And in last week's reading at our harvest service, Jesus has fed 2,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. A boy's packed lunch. Despite following Jesus for nearly two years, the disciples hadn't yet got the full picture of who Jesus is. And in our passage today, there are two more miracles for us to see. Jesus walking on the water and the sick healed just by touching the edge of Jesus' cloak. Now our, our modern scientific minds and I, I studied chemistry, I worked at St. Genta down at Grangemouth, so I'm a scientist by background and I understand the way that scientific minds work, the logical mindset, and we might dismiss miracles out of hand. This is because the prevailing Western mindset for at least the last two to three hundred years since the Enlightenment has said that there are only natural causes for everything that happens in our world today. However, the Bible categorically says that there is more to this world than is found in nature that can be proven by science or can be observed by eye. There's the supernatural as well as the natural. There's God, there's the angels, there's demons, there's the human soul spirit. And of course, there are miracles which are supernatural. A miracle is when God breaks into the natural world and does something above and beyond the natural. When Mark records Jesus' miracles, he wants us to see beyond the miracles. He wants us to see beyond the signs. He wants us to see the person, the person behind the signs. And today, we're going to learn about the supernatural person, Jesus. And we're going to find why we need him in life storms. 
why we need him in life's storms, when we're afraid, when we're in doubt, and when we are sick. We need Jesus, the supernatural. <laughs> the person who will give his, us his supernatural presence and who will reveal to us his supernatural power. So let's firstly look at this first point that we encounter in this passage, the supernatural person of Jesus. He is amazing in all that he does. This is a wonderful picture. One of the most famous portrayals of Jesus walking on the water by von Claver. The setting of our story is the Sea of Galilee. And in verse 45 we read, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the lake, the other side of the Sea of Galilee, to Bethsaida, <coughs> while he dismissed the crowd. That's the crowd that had gathered when he fed the 20,000 people. Why did Jesus make or compel the disciples to leave by boat? Well, Jesus has just fed this multitude, and in John's account of this incident, the crowd were so enthralled by Jesus that they wanted to make Jesus king by force. You see, they were looking for their Messiah. And, and maybe, just maybe, this is Jesus' Messiah, but they wanted to make him king by force so that he would kick the Romans out of the land who were occupying the land at that time. Jesus, though, was a different king. He was not a king who would come with a sword. Jesus is a supernatural king with a different mission. In humility, Jesus would ride on a donkey. And that's the Easter story, remember? Palm Sunday would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, give his life on a, a brutal Roman cross for our failures, for our sin, to make us right with God and establish his rule of love in each one of our hearts. But the disciples still hadn't got that message, not just about who Jesus is, but about his mission too. And because they might be swayed by the crowd and make Jesus king by force, Jesus tells them to get into the boat, essentially get out of here, leave this place. The crossing, the crossing across the Sea of Galilee would be an unforgettable moment in these disciples' life never to be forgotten. Jesus then went up on the mountainside to pray while his disciples sailed off. And over and over again, we see in the Bible, Jesus taking time out to be with his God and Father. He knew that there were times to be busy working for God, and there were times to be quiet and silent with his Father in prayer. To hear from his Father, to get strength from his Father and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But what is, what is Jesus praying about? Well, possibly a number of things. But I'm sure he's praying for his disciples on that boat as he looks from the mountain over the Sea of Galilee, three or four miles ahead, in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the sea. He's praying for his disciples. And they are straining away. I don't know if you've ever took a rowing boat out on the sea or even on a pond. Sometimes the oars are heavy. These are wooden oars. And Jesus, these disciples are rowing and Jesus is praying. He knows the effort that these disciples are making as the wind is against them. And I find it so reassuring that just as Jesus with his supernatural insight prayed for his disciples, the Bible in Romans 8 verse 34 says this, that he's in heaven at the right hand of God praying for each one of us right now. <clears throat> Jesus not only prayed then, but Jesus is praying for each one of us. He's interceding for us. That's how much Jesus cares for us in the storms that we are going through as his followers right here, right now. <laughs> you know, the darkest time of the night is just before dawn breaks. And that's when Jesus Christ, the Lord of all creation, the Lord of the wind and the waves, starts to walk towards his disciples across Galilee. And as Jesus draws near to the boat, as they are straining on the oars with all their effort, the disciples look and they go white. They think it's a ghost. They're absolutely terrified. So Jesus speaks these words of comfort. 
Take courage. It is I. It is I. Now, sometimes people are given names which reflect who they are or what they do. I read of an eye specialist in America called Dr. Seawright. And there's a supermarket meat manager called Brad Slaughter. And my favourite, the pitch, and you'll love this, the musicians, the pitch perfect music teacher, Miss C Sharp. When Jesus says, it is I, he is revealing his supernatural name. And in the Greek, it is I means ego emi, which means I am. And I am are the very words that God gives him to himself when he speaks to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3, when he's speaking to Moses from the burning bush. He says, I am Moses. In the desert, Moses sees this bush on fire, but it's not been burned up. God calls from the bush and commands Moses, go back to Egypt, Moses, and set my people free so that they may worship me. These people were enslaved and God wanted to, to set them free. So Moses asks, who are you? And the Lord replies, I am who I am. Tell my people that I am sent you. That's the personal, holy name of God. And God wants us to know him by that name too. I am. I am the Almighty. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. God himself. And so when Jesus says, it is I, or I am, he's saying, the same God who rescued his people from slavery in Egypt and brought them through the Red Sea is the same person who is standing right here on the waves next to you. Friends, Jesus isn't a ghost. Jesus is God. It's as simple as that. Jesus, the supernatural, astonishing. Do you know, even now, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up when I speak of it. Jesus is not a ghost. Jesus is God. Jesus then climbs into the boat. The wind dies down, the sea is calm, and, and the disciples mouths are just wide open in astonishment. Why? They've just begun to understand that their teacher, their rabbi, is the supernatural Lord over the wind, over the waves, and over their lives. You may have heard of the Christian Lee Strobel. He's an award-winning journalist and former atheist. He set out to investigate Christianity with the same rigour he applied to the covering <coughs> stories for the Chicago Tribune. But when his wife Leslie became a Christian, Strobel was determined to disprove the faith that his wife had. As an investigative journalist, he delved into the evidence for the resurrection, Jesus claims to be God, and the reliability of scripture. And his journey led him to an encounter an encounter with the supernatural identity of Jesus as the I am. And Strobel realized that Jesus wasn't merely just a, an historical figure, but God incarnate, God coming into our world. The am, I am who has all the power to remove our doubts and skepticism. And after two years of study, Strobel surrendered to the truth of Christ and placed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today he shares his story to show how Jesus transforms even the most hardened of hearts like his. Friends, let me ask you today, have you discovered Jesus' true identity? Do you know him as the Lord with authority over all creation, over the wind and the waves of trouble which you face in your life? Then we see in this passage the supernatural presence of Jesus. As I read this passage for myself, I felt very uncomfortable. And I want to share this discomfort with you this morning. One of the uncomfortable truths of following Jesus is that he sometimes asks us to do something that will be costly and will be difficult. In his supernatural power, Jesus knew the storm was coming. 
And yet he told Peter, James and John and the crew to get into the boat and to start to row across Galilee. And from the mountain, Jesus could see that they were straining hard at the oars against the fierce wind and the tumultuous waves. And this word straining means they were in torment, they were in torture. The, the, their limbs, the muscles were absolutely burning, aching as they were trying to get to the other side. It's true, isn't it? Our natural inclination is to avoid pain. We want to be happy. We want to sail through life with no problems whatsoever. We'd rather stay on the shore, avoid the hard graft of rowing and the storm danger itself. However, the, the Christian writer C.S. Lewis says this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain. It's in the storms that we learn to lean into God. And that's when our faith really, really grows. In the storm times, in the difficult times, in the hard times of life. At the darkest and most difficult time in the storm, Jesus draws near to the boat, walking on the water. And his presence makes all the difference. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And then he jumps into the boat and all is calm. As I think about you, all of you, and those who aren't here this morning, and, and as I pray for you as my church family, I'm acutely aware of the winds of adversity that many, many, many of you are struggling against at this time. For some, it's just trying to keep your head above water, doing your best to bring up your family with all the temptations and pressures that come against our kids these days. Some of you have recently been bereaved. Some of you face employment uncertainty. There's the cost of living pressures that face many of us. Do I buy food or do I switch on my heating? What a terrible dilemma to face. How do I avoid, avoid getting into debt or even get out of it? Others, of course, are facing physical and mental challenges to your health. And the help you need is, is maybe not forthcoming because of the severe pressures on the NHS. And this reflects the stress of working life for many of you. The pressures of just getting through the daily grind of work. Others have had upsetting damage to your property. Others have had storms that have come in in different ways and you're really struggling to deal with it. Then I think about those who live faithfully for God in your home or your workplace with honesty, with integrity and with industry. Your family and colleagues know all about your faith, but you get a hard time. And maybe you're even discriminated against for what you stand up for, for your faith. <coughs> Can I tell you this morning that Jesus knows and Jesus comes near to you. Jesus cares. Friends, when the, the wind is fierce and you're too tired to go on, Jesus comes to you and he gives you his supernatural presence. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Jesus assures us of his peace in those times. He jumps into our boat and he says, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Horatio Spafford eh, was a successful lawyer who nearly lost everything. First, the great Chicago fire completely destroyed his business. And then a tragic shipwreck claimed the lives of his four precious daughters. Sailing to meet his bereaved wife, Spafford passed the very spot where his daughters had drowned. And in this storm of an imaginable sorrow, he penned the words, of that great ancient hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Spafford found peace 
Not in the absence of trials, not in the absence of the storm, but in the loving presence of Jesus Christ with him in the storm. Oh, how we need to experience the life-changing, supernatural presence of the Spirit of Jesus within each one of us. And I'd love for each one of us to go from this place today, repeating these amazing words, repeating these eternal words. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. So when the storms come, as they will for every single one of us, we can repeat them and be assured of the peaceful presence of Jesus to calm our troubled soul. Jesus' supernatural person, his supernatural presence, leads to Jesus' supernatural power. In verses 53 to 56, we read these extraordinary words, the account of Jesus' power at work. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and they anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus. It's funny that, isn't it? The disciples didn't recognise him on the lake, but the people recognised who he was. And they ran from that whole region, carrying the sick on mats to wherever he was heard. And wherever he went, into the villages, the towns, or the countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplace. And they begged him to touch even the edge of his cloak. And when, they were, when Jesus, they touched his cloak, all were healed. Do we see the unstoppable, transformative power of Jesus? Wherever he went, crowds of people brought their sick, believing that simply touching his cloak would bring immediate healing. And they weren't disappointed, not at all. Everyone who reached out in faith was wonderfully healed. At this time, sickness often led to isolation, to pain, and even social rejection. The sick were desperate. They needed the hope that Jesus could give them. Their willingness to travel great distances and their urgency in reaching Christ shows that they truly believed in his ability to heal. The edge of his cloak became the focal point of their faith. But Mark's emphasis wasn't on the cloak, but Jesus himself. You see, God's power isn't restricted to a place or to a problem. It moves wherever there is faith. These verses have powerful implications for your life and for my life today. First, we're reminded that Jesus' supernatural power is still at work now as it was then 2,000 years ago. He still heals, he still restores, he still transforms lives today. Just as the people of Gennesaret trusted in his power, so we can approach him in faith by prayer and by petition. No matter how desperate our situation may seem to be, no matter how bad things are, no matter how stormy our life is, Jesus is there when we reach out in faith. You know, recently we prayed for our dear brother in Christ, Callum's headache. And Jesus took it away, but he's got more problems. In faith, we brought Liz Scobie to God in prayer and her infection was treated. Whether we're struggling with physical illness, emotional pain or spiritual dryness, Jesus is still able to heal. He just asks to, for us to reach out in faith. Second, we learn that our faith doesn't need to be perfect. The people of Gennesaret didn't wait for an elaborate ceremony or a special moment. No, <coughs> they, they rushed and placed the, the, their mats of the sick in the marketplace. And they simply reached out to Jesus where they were. And you and I don't need to have everything figured out. We're all broken. We're all sinful. We've all got problems. We just need to come to him with open hearts and believe. And in his power, he can make us whole. And finally, these verses challenge me, challenge us to bring others to Jesus. Just as we were, were thinking about last Wednesday at the growth groups, about sharing the salvation that we've received in Christ with others. And just as people carried their sick loved ones to him, we are called to lead those around us to the one who heals and who saves. Whether through prayer, whether through encouragement, whether through just listening, or sharing our own personal story of salvation, what God has done for us, we can help others experience the supernatural power of Jesus. Jesus' power, friends, has no limits. 
None at all. When we reach out to him in faith, we can expect him to move in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So let's be bold. Let's be believing. Let's believe that he can still do wonderful things today. None of us are superhuman. We all have storms. We all have fears. And we all have illnesses. Yet we have a supernatural God, Jesus, who controls <coughs> the storms. And in his supernatural presence, he will come and he will calm our fears. And in his supernatural power, he wants to heal all our sicknesses, all our diseases, and all our sin, and bring us to himself again if we're separated from him. <coughs> Can I ask you today, as I ask myself, can we invite Jesus into our boat, as it were? And can we place our faith in the supernatural person of Jesus today? He is the one who transforms. He is the one who will save. Let's pray together. In these quiet moments, let's reflect on the storms that perhaps we're going through. Let's reflect on this great potential that we have to invite Jesus into our life if we haven't done so already. And let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you with hearts full of praise and adoration, acknowledging your holy name as the great I am. You're the eternal one, the unchanging one, and you're ever present in our lives. We thank you for your constant presence, Lord, even in the midst of life's storms. When the winds howl and the waves rise, you remind us, don't be afraid, for I am with you. We are deeply grateful for the peace and courage you offer us in moments of fear and uncertainty. We also lift up those who are suffering physically and spiritually. We ask for your healing hand to touch those who are sick and help those who are tending those sick relatives, that they may experience your power and restoration. Heal broken bodies, we pray, Lord. Heal wounded hearts and renew their spirits with your love and grace. Lord, we commit our lives afresh and perhaps for the first time to you today. Lord, would you come and be our saviour? Would you come uh, and bring your supernatural presence into our lives? We place our faith in you and trust in you. Strengthen our belief, we pray. Deepen our devotion and empower us to walk boldly in your name. And may our lives be a testament to your glory as we continue to serve and follow you throughout the rest of this week. In your precious name we pray. Amen.